If you're just joining us, then welcome to the Writer's Corner live show. I'm your host, Bridgette Limbanda from Cape Africa. As soon as possible, Bite Edge, StreamYard, and Be Live Media. It's said that reading makes you more empathetic. It's a way to escape your life and it can take you to faraway lands or put you in other people's shoes, etc., etc. Today we're going to be talking to multi-genre author Sherry Chapman about her book, A Killer Revisited. Don't go away. We'll be right back with the Writer's Corner live show. If you have just joined us, you are watching the Writer's Corner live show. I'm your host, Bridgette Limbanda from Cape Town in South Africa. Welcome if you are watching us on Amazon Live, on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube, on LinkedIn. This is an audience-centric show. So just know that the comments are being monitored and um, that you know, you're welcome. Tell us if you're new. If you've never watched the show, the Writer's Corner Live show has been going for over three years, three and a half years. And um, we've met many people from around the world. And I want to give a huge big shout out to Hamad, who's watching us from Pakistan. Um, so a shout out to Hamad. Welcome to the show. Glad, always glad to see you online. Today, we're going to be talking to Sherry Chapman about her book, A Killer Revisited. Um, but do say if you're new, we'll give you a shout out. We've been doing the show for over three years and you will notice that in if you're watching the show over on Amazon, you will notice that um, apart from our book today, let me just reach out over here, A Killer Revisited and oh my goodness, and just trying to get the light right is a mission. But there we go. There we go. I think you can see that. A Killer Revisited is our book um that we are going to be focusing on today and you'll see that that is in the carousel if you're watching us over on amazon that's a killer revisited by sherry chapman um it is in the carousel um along with a couple of my other favorite books you know we've interviewed so many authors over the last three years that we've you know we've amassed a whole a whole bunch of books so you'll see there's there's a lot to to um to choose from but we're going to be focusing on a killer revisited today by sherry chapman um i've just got a whole bunch of books here on my desk but you'll have to go back and watch our past shows to hear about those so before we bring on Sherry, I want to introduce my friend and co-host, Mary Elizabeth Jackson. She's a special needs and disabilities advocate. She's a ghost writer, an award-winning author, and her latest release is called Cheers from Heaven with Thornton Klein. Um, this book focuses on lessons we can learn from bullying, and it empowers families with the ability to grow from that experience. Mary and I are both in the uh, book Invisible No More, Invincible Forevermore. It has stories of remarkable resilience and all proceeds from that particular book goes to a nonprofit organization called Dress for Success. So it empowers other women in the process. Um, and thank you for the compliment, Hamad. Mary's watch, Mary is in Nashville, USA. I'm in South Africa. So um it's we're global we're absolutely global and we love that so let me bring on my co-host mary how are you today i am fantastic and yes we have lots of amazing authors we have interviewed over the years um we are in an amazing book to empower women together um yes and cheers from heaven i just released a thorn Klein is to empower kids and just teach them to accept their differences to accept themselves 
others' differences. They have choices, how to be kind, all that good positive stuff, right? That um, is very important right now in the mental health of kids and grownups and all of us everywhere is so important at this time in the world and trying to learn how to conquer that. But uh, we're very excited about the author that we have on today and can't wait to hear about her story. And I really, I'm always fascinated by authors who write in multi-genres um, because, you know, for some people, I think it comes very natural because they have so many interests. So it'll be, it'll be interesting to find out is Sherry a person who has a lot of interest in different things. And that's why she has written in different genres or is it, is it something that, you know, is, is a real, it's a challenge for her. So that's why she did it. Did she want to say, well, what is it like to be in this genre? How is it to write in the, you know, cause I, I, I write for children and then I've done a couple of adults. I've got an adult one coming out next year and it's so different to switch. And even ghost writing is so different because most of that stuff has either been very data driven or it's, it's, a person's real story, true story about their life. And that's not anything I can make up, you know? So it, you have to change your mindset and everything that goes with it. So I think it's really fascinating. I can't wait to hear about this from Sherry, our author today. Here. Sh Sherry is a multi-genre author and she writes about historical romance, dark suspense, sci-fi and more. And um, she's really nailed the art of captivating uh, the attention of her audience using uh, twisting fantasy and reality together. And, um, and once you are hooked, there's no escape from her <laughs> writing technique. So she shall she's we? She's doing a good job. She is. She definitely is doing um, an absolutely good job. And Hamid says you look very smart, Mary. Oh, I so, do. All right, I'll put my yes. glasses back on. Yes, we want to look yes. smart, don't we? Hamid says you look very smart. So, yeah. Hamid, thank you for that compliment. You are awesome. So let's let's get uh, Sherry onto the show so we can hear more about um, her book and why she wrote it, how she wrote it, and just about her backstory. Let's get on the show. Hi, Sherry. Welcome. Hi, guys. How are you? We're great. We're excited what, to have what, you here. So we've kind of set it up for well, at least, you know, a question that we have for you, right, Virginia? Right. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you very much for making the time to join us on the show today. Um, tell us a little bit about your, your journey so far as an author. You know, how did you get started? I'm always fascinated to know what it is that made people write. And, you know, you're, you're a, a, a multifaceted, um, multi-genre writer. And that's intriguing because, I mean, I don't know how you make the switch between the different genres. Um, so tell us how you got started. You know, was it your was it your parents? Who's your biggest supporter? When did you first start writing? Like, you know, a lot of people say that once they start writing and the bug's bitten and they've gotten into it, they can't stop and they can't help themselves. So where did <laughs> your journey start? Well, um, I knew I wanted to be an author when I was in fourth grade. I fell in love with Walter Farley's books, um, the, the Black Stallion, when I was in that age range. And then I moved into fantasy with my fifth grade teacher, the C.S. Lewis, with his Chronicles of Narnia series. And I just started tinkering in short stories back then. Um, then life happened. I, I became a special ed teacher of high functioning special needs students. Um, my strength was reading and writing. And so I did a lot of exploration with my students trying to figure out what um, got their interest, what would hook them on reading. Um, so that's kind of where my widespread of interest started was just helping kids find 
uh, what appealed to them. So I had to delve into it myself. Um, so la large range there. Um, and then I had my own children. So my writing career was delayed um, until they graduated and I retired from teaching. So now it, I can focus on me and what my, I feel like my, I've, I've been called to help people and animals, but um, this is what has called to me since fourth grade. <laughs> Oh, I love that. And and we didn't even bring that up. And I apologize for not bringing up your special ed background because being an advocate myself, that... <laughs> So, um, so that's yeah, that's that's very special. Just the fact that you um, are also a, a special special needs teacher. Um, how did that happen for you? Is that something that you got into because of you know family, or was it just something that you felt a calling towards? Uh, well, I don't know. Um, I feel like I'm a lifelong teacher. I just feel like that's my job. I didn't know what I wanted to teach, but I found myself, I, I'm always drawn to the underdog. So whoever is losing is who I want to help for some reason. You know, if it's the losing team, I want to vote for the losing team. I don't know why, but um, I don't think of children as losers, of course, but um, I feel like I'm the person that can help them reach their full potential um, I can see the good in them where it may be more work, but, you know, and, and some, when you're in a classroom of 30 kids, it's hard to give that one student that needs more attention, more attention. So I felt like that was my job to help them fit in with society and be successful. And so part of it was my call to help the person that's needing more help. And, and then I just decided that was what I was going to do. That's I amazing. That. that is That's amazing. amazing. Thank you for, for taking that on in life because um, our children need it. Um, and, you know, I, I it's sad because the world says that these kids are broken. You know, they're not broken. They have just come right. in indifferently or and we're all different from each other. But it takes someone like what you're doing, Sherry, to be able to be like that child whisperer, you know, to help a child see their potential so that they can then go into the world and be successful because all kids can. It really doesn't matter what I mean. I, I have a cousin who is cerebral palsy. He went to college. He lives on his own. His car is made for him. Him. I mean, he's been so successful in his life. He's not let that stop him. And I think that's such a beautiful thing. And, you know, using writing um, as a tool uh, and, and one of those, you know, those avenues for potential of processing and having an outlet and helping people to figure out who they are and be able to grow is, is a just an amazing tool to be able to use for people. So, you know, have you, I know what you're writing um, have you thought about, or do any of your characters in your books have disabilities or challenges or, or anything like that? Well, um, in, in my, not in the book that I'm, um, promoting right now, but like in the, in the, the historical fiction, um, it is about a girl who is, in a family of kind of alcoholics. She lost her mother on the trail. It's set back in the 1800s. They, they were the first people into the Sioux Indian territory, first group of people, I should say. And when her mother uh, drowned in a river they were crossing, the father and the son turned to alcoholism and they left her alone all day. So she had to learn basically how to do everything herself, how to provide for her family. So she wasn't disabled, but in a way she was, it's kind of like a learning disability. We all have weaknesses within us that we have to learn to cope with. And so I'm trying to show, um, you know, that each of us have weaknesses that we can overcome. And, and so she, she has a lot of learning curves in this because she's the one that goes, um, is rescued by the, the chief and he takes her back to his community and she has to learn, you know, she's the only English speaking person there. She has to learn their language. She has to learn their culture. She has to learn different expectations. And so it's a lot about Indian culture and life. And then of course it develops into a romance, but you know, she thinks she's a guest and he's like, no, you're here to stay. And so there's a lot of um, mindset and cultural things she has to overcome. So in a way, um, 
you know, that's kind of a disability when you're thrown into a, a, a foreign environment and you have to learn how to survive and function. Yeah, sink or swim, right? So let's switch to the book that we're focusing on today, A Killer Revisited. Um, how did that story come about? Tell us a little bit about the book um, and why you wanted to write the book. And then another, you know, interesting tidbit was that you have you've written the book as a standalone, but you've also left the door open. So tell us a little bit about that as well. Okay, well, I was with a company that is no longer um, around and they had put out a call to write a reincarnation story. And it was a, a short story. So the anthologies is a collection of short works by, so I wrote a story and it was about um, a guy, I'm very spiritual. So I, t in, in my reincarnation story, I made, um, the government made clones for army, you know, super soldiers, and they didn't have souls. They were just produ produced in um, a lab. And so they were kind of like robots. They couldn't function on their own. And so they were like, how can we make these soldiers self-sufficient? And um, they hired a scientist um, and put him in a death row inmate jail setting. And when um, with his work, he discovered how to capture a person's soul. So when they executed an inmate, they transferred his soul into the super soldier body. And that's how they propelled the soldier to life. And, um, you know, of course, with the reincarnation story, um, there's a they have these pills that heal them. So if they're injured, they can heal really quickly. But what they don't know is it also heals the soul. And he started to remember his past life. And at first, he's not a very good guy. And he seeks revenge on those who have experimented on him. So it's kind of uh, scary. The scientists are scared to have a super soldier who remembers his past life. And he didn't want to be part of the experiment. So that's kind of the, the idea behind the story and how I got started with it. Well, and are there any real people in there or is it all fictional? Um, do you mean based on real characters? Is that what you mean? Yeah. I, I think it's true that, um, our experiences kind of dictate how we write. So, um, I'm, I didn't intentionally put factors of people I've met into my characters, but I think that's how you breathe life into them is that, you know, you, you take your experiences and you bring them to life. So probably a lot of my characters are a mix of people I've met. Mm. And, and isn't that funny how we do that, but, but it gives us uh, reference points and, you know, that's how so many, there are stories out there that end up with a happy ending because it's something that happened in someone's life that didn't work out. And so they went and wrote it the way they would love for it to happen in, in their <laughs> life. Right. Yes. So we have to teach our kids that, right. That all the happy endings didn't really always happen, but you know, <laughs> it's wonderful to think about, but um so you left the door open for this to be a series or a there to be a sequel uh, possible, right? I did. Um, I At the end, um, I don't know if I uh, want to tell how it ends, but they think that the killer's taken care of and, well, he fakes his death. So they think he's dead, but he's not dead. And he's still um, watching the guy who's behind the experiment, the very uh, the the general in the army. So I leave it to where, you know, hmm, is there going to be another story? There's a lot of avenues I can break out into because when you're transferring someone's soul into someone else's body, you can do so much with that. I mean, I did death row inmates into super soldiers, but, you know, who knows where the experiments could lead us in the future. So I kind of left that door open. Um, and it, I've had a lot, a lot of good feedback on the story. So and my editor, he's like, you could have a 20 year career with this if you wanted to, because there's so much you can do with it. Do you have a favorite passage in the book that you could share, share with us? Because, you know, the audience always like to just hear what your favorite um, little section in the book is, is it, is it possible for you to just read a paragraph that you feel, um, is special to you? Well, um, I thought I would read the very beginning paragraph. I don't know if it's my favorite, but it kind of, it jumps around in time a lot. So, um, maybe the, the very beginning would be okay. 
Perfect. Okay. All right. Present day, I kind of uh, put a header on there so the, the reader knows what timeline we're looking at. Wiley noticed a difference in himself. He was beginning to experience more. Oh, never mind. That's the wrong part. <laughs> Hang on. Let me scoot this back. Okay. No worries. We'll give you. We'll give you a minute to to find it. So, anyone who's just it. joined us now, we are reading a passage. The author of the book a, "A Killer Revisited," Sherry Chapman, is going to read us the introductory paragraph of her book "A Killer Revisited." Present day, a man on a mission. Wiley's home office was tiny with no windows. Its single light flickered, and the effect excited him. The man rummaged through an arsenal in a large canvas bag in the closet. Wiley slid black gloves over his work-hardened hands and clenched a few times. Next, he examined a heavy bowie knife. It caught the light as he turned it. He practiced a few stabbing motions. Satisfied, the assassin removed his gloves and placed both items carefully in a smaller traveling duffel with the rest of his dark plain clothing. This was the night. Wiley, the chameleon, was exhilarated. This was not an assignment and he a mere pawn. This was a mission of his own. The excitement of obtaining his freedom motivated him. However, he knew he must maintain an air of normalcy around his handlers. Wiley straightened, relaxed his shoulders and controlled his breath. If things went well, he was on his way to true freedom. And that's how I start. Wow. Mm, okay, so yeah, it leaves you wanting, it leaves the reader wanting to know what is happening, what's going on. I need to read more, you know. So yeah, that's a that's a great introduction. Um now, do you have, you know, what what is your what kind of support system do you have around you, you know, that helps you because everybody has a support system of some sort, um, even if it's just, you know, <laughs> they get to have everything taken care of for the moment that they're writing so they can have the space that they need. So, you know, um, who are your biggest supporters in your life, your biggest fans? And, you know, what kind of um, what kind of support do you have for all this, all the work you're doing? Well, I'm very fortunate to have a close family. Um, my mother is a big fan. She likes to read my stuff. In fact, she helped me with this book. She's like, there's a little bit of a disconnect between the killer and the detective. And so she she kind of brought my attention to that. And so I found a connection and incorporated that into the book. Um, a lot of times when you're writing, you know up here what it's supposed to say and you're not always sure because you read with expectation your own work and you think it says, you know, what you think it says. So beta readers are wonderful. Um, my daughters also, I have four daughters, Michaela, Hannah, Sydney, and Emily. And um, my oldest and my youngest um, have helped me quite a bit with creative ideas, um, telling me if something's missing, if the flow is good or not those kind of things. So, and I also have a couple of beta readers and my editor, um, Eric Myers is wonderful. He really helped me a lot with this book. He's like, Hey, this is missing. You need to answer these questions. So he's more of the reason it kind of has a lot of backtrack story in it is because he's like, well, you need to, you know, explain this a little bit more. So he really helped me, um, perform my, um, you know, just become a better writer called my attention to a lot of things. Yeah, that is amazing. Could you, you know, we always like to ask our authors also if they have a tip. Now you've seemed to have mastered the art of um, compelling storytelling. <laughs> do, do you have one or two tips to give to an aspiring author that could help them um, become better at storytelling because people are going to because you, you I think you all aim for that wow factor where people are hooked and they they want to just turn the page and not put the book down all night you know how do you get to that level of compelling storytelling well there's a couple of factors I think um your beginning is extremely important you need to hook draw in those people so like for me, the next part of the book is um, there's a couple of pages that are a little bit more boring. 
but because you got that hook and that excitement and that action in the very beginning, they're willing to read a couple pages of not as interesting things to move on to the next. So your hook is very important to start in the middle of action is what I recommend. And then, um, you know, you can backtrack or flashback or go to another scene so that you've got that hook and that reader. That's the most important is the very few pages. Um, the next thing that really helped me grow was being able to take constructive criticism. Constructive criticism helps you grow. Um, you can't take things personally and you will have bad reviews. Um, when you become published, you're going to, you might have a lot more good than you have bad, but the one thing that stands out in your mind is the bad one. So you have to remember that's one person's opinion. And if the majority of people seem to like it, then, uh, don't get hung up on, a negative review or constructive criticism because you're not perfect. We can always improve. Mm, very, very valid points. And if you, if you want to grow as a writer or oh, you've got to be able to take that constructive criticism um, yes. and not take it personally, but use it to make you a better writer. Um, you know, I have a couple of mentors who have written, you know, have written over a hundred books each. And so their feedback, I really val value because it's only going to push me to work harder to be better at it. And so it's a really valid point. You, you know, in, I, I had a literary agent one time, I had a conversation with one and she said, write your first chapter, throw it out and start all over again. That's her advice for writers, because usually that first writing, we're just kind of, bleh, you know, all over the paper or your tablet or your laptop, getting it out. And then you need to go back and kind of fix that and, and, and fine tune it and, and, you know, rearrange it and all that other stuff. So you definitely have to be open-minded and you have to be willing to take that um, advice and constructive criticism. And you need a bit of a backbone because, you know, you may write, you know, you may think it's absolutely amazing. And you brought up a valid point, Sherry, what we have in our head, what we're trying to get across on paper Sometimes we think that we are, but we really aren't when somebody else goes in and they go, well, wait, this doesn't make any sense to me. I'm lost here. What happened between these two people? And, and we're thinking, oh, we accomplished that. So it is good to have beta readers, uh, whether you know these folks or not. You know, um, I know with the the book that, that we just released, we tried to get that age group. I had some kids that age group read and say, is this something that you would say or do at your age? Cause I didn't want to talk down to them. I wanted to write from their point of view. And so all of this stuff is very important, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So tell us, Sherry, which age group did you write the killer revisited for? Um, you know, is it, is it aimed at a particular audience? Well, um, I taught high functioning special ed kids in the high school setting. So, I mean, I've actually written my first children's book that's not released yet because I do like to try different things. I like to write with different viewpoints. Most of what I write is third person, but I do have a story that's coming out that is first person. But um, A Killer Revisited does have violence. It does have cussing. Um, you know, there's... I would think it would be more of an adult or um, young adult, someone who could handle, you know, there's so much violence in video games and movies and television shows anymore. So I would say young adult to adult would probably be it. But a, a young child, sixth or seventh grade may not quite be ready for it, but it's, it's not excessively, but there is, you know, it's a super soldier assassin. So there is killing and there is cussing in it. Yeah, I think I think parents would probably take the cue from the title that it's you know it's not a it's not a it's not a children's book, it's more a you know young adult kind of book. Yes. You're not going to read it to your two year old. You know, it's not a lullaby. <laughs> um, <laughs> so sometimes the title and and the image on the book. Um, I forgot to ask you about that. How did you get you know because we almost the we're almost at the end of our interview right now, but I do want to ask you, uh, how did you get your illustrator to um, to get what you really wanted on the page? Because you know, conveying what you have in your head that you envision on the on the on your cover isn't what the illustrator ne necessarily has in their mind. So, how do you get that across? 
Well, I'm lucky to have a cover designer. Um, I met her on Facebook. So, you know, but she she's very reasonably priced. And I tell her kind of what I what the book is about. And then she'll come up with some ideas, you know, like, what do you think about this picture? Or what do you think about that picture? So, you know, it wasn't exactly what was in my head, but I'm happy with the results. So I wanted a soldier and that he was an experiment. So in my cover, you can kind of see the background, uh, little light lines of um, like chemicals, um, equations and, you know, things like that. And then his image is kind of distorted, meaning he's a clone. So there's multiple versions of that person. So she got my idea. Of I think Sherry's just lost her yeah, connection there for a second awesome. and hopefully oh. she does come back. <laughs> yes. Yes. So she, so her, the, the person, the person she used was able to get across what her vision was. And that's really great when that happens because sometimes it doesn't happen that way. <laughs> so we're so grateful, Sherry, that you were here with us. There you're back. And we're so glad that you're here with us. And thank you so much for sharing your time, your book, your journey, everything. We are very grateful for that. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. And we will look forward to having you back on sometime, right? I would love to. It's it's an absolute pleasure. And I just want to say hello to everyone over on um, watching us on Amazon Live. Um, and I'm just having a look there. I can't see whose name it is. If you can just tell me very quickly what your name is, then I can tell. Um, oh, it's Corinda. Corinda, thanks very much, Corinda. And also Tish is watching us over there. And we had Hamad earlier watching us from Pakistan. So a huge big shout out to everyone that has joined us live today. And if you're watching this on the replay, we were talking about A Killer Revisited by Sherry Chapman. And I must say your first paragraph was was very, very, very intriguing. You know, it really did. I think you accomplished the mission of hooking us and wanting to know more about the story. So very well done on that. And so huge big thank you to our audience today. Those who watched us live and those who are watching on the on the replay. Thank you so, so much. And take care, everyone. We'll see you back next week, same time on the Writer's Corner live show. Mm -hmm.